for me, it's been quite hectic. We've been moving house, and um, it seems like the more you sort things, the more chaotic it gets. So I wonder if you've been in that situation. But now, it seems a little bit more settled. Um, but as I was just getting the key to the new house, I approached the house, and somebody was walking past. And I thought, I recognize them. And um, it was a, a, a person that I'd met teaching that was in one of the schools that I'd been in many years ago. And at that time, she had to leave because things in her life were really, really tricky. And I kept in contact with her and tried to support her through it. But she was at a different stage of her life. She's only six doors down from where we've moved in. And it was one of those encounters at a special time, a time that, you know, I couldn't... It was just an odd time in the day that I went to get the key. It was a real moment, a God moment, an encounter, a God moment. And I wonder if you've ever had one of those where you have met someone in a different place, somewhere bizarre, and it was just the right moment. And we're going to look at a story today just like that, of the right moment. Now, over the weeks, we've been looking at signs of the kingdom of God. We were looking in John's Gospels and seeing what are those key signs of the kingdom of God that we can grab and apply to our life. And what I want to look today at is worshipping in spirit and truth. We're going to look at the whole theme of worship within this passage here. So firstly, I'm going to explore Jesus and this encounter with the woman. I'm going to see how Jesus comes to the woman and engages in this conversation. And during that, we're going to find out a little bit more about the character of the woman. And then next, I'm going to explore what is worship? What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? And then finally, we're going to go on to consider um, how the kingdom of God advances through this encounter. So hopefully you're going to follow this through with me. So firstly, let's look at the passage and look at closely at what Jesus and the woman and this connection. So Jesus is passing through Samaria. He gets tired and he sits by a well. Now, if we think about his journey up to this well, we think he's gone from Galilee and he's going to Judea. Now, no Jew would normally go through Samaria. It was a no-go route. The Jews and Samaritans did not get on. There was tension in this place between them. Normally, they would take a little route around the place to get to um, Judea. But he intentionally went through Samaria. He had a purpose. He had a plan. Think about it. Jesus goes out of his way to meet with us. Sometimes in the tension and the chaos of life, Jesus goes out his way to engage us. Now, Jesus waited at this well. There was this waiting for this meeting. He's tired, I know, but his disciples went off to get food and there would be people in the town. He didn't go with them. He waited on his own in these extreme conditions, the heat of the day, waited there. And it made me think, this is Jesus, the Son of God, who's come for a purpose, to preach, to heal, busy, 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 and he waits for this one opportunity. Isn't that incredible? Jesus waits for us to engage with him. However lost or however remote we feel, he's waiting for us. And as Jesus sits there, he encounters this Samaritan woman and he engages in this conversation. 
Well, there's lots of things that just don't sit right here. We see that in this culture, Samaritans and Jews, as I said earlier, do not mix. Any, any contact with a Samaritan would make a Jew unclean. And she was a woman. And in those times, men didn't talk to women out in the open. It just wasn't known to happen. And it was in the heat of the day at noontime. And this tells us a little bit about the character of the woman. Because women used to go and collect water and do their washing and their duties together as a group. And they would go in the call of the day, at the beginning of the day, or at the end of the day. But she was on her own in the noonday sun, in the heat. This means that she had a little bit of a story. She was isolated. She didn't have contact with friends. She was on her own. And maybe she was carrying shame. And here she comes on her own to collect the water, to do her duties. And she engages in a very long conversation. And Jesus starts prophetically, doesn't he, speak into her life. And he tells her things that she probably didn't really want to hear from somebody else, you know. He says to her, go, go and bring your husband. Go, go and bring him along here. And she goes, you know, I haven't got, you know, I haven't got a husband. Um, you know, and he says, I know you've had five husbands and the man you're with is not your husband Can you feel the shame that she's feeling here, that somebody knows the inner side of her, her being, everything about her? And here there's a woman seeking love, seeking um, attention, but she's an outcast and she's isolated. And years ago, as a young Christian, I used to read this passage and think, oh my God, goodness, what a terrible woman, you know, as a, as a teenager. I, I, you know, how awful this is. And it dawned on me, we're all, we're all s- sinners. We've all got a past. We all do things, probably not like this, but we've all got things attached to us that are probably we're a little bit shameful of. And it made me think, oh my goodness, Lord, never must I look at this and pass judgment on this woman, because I'm just as bad as that. I don't do those things, tell it, you know. (laughs) But, you know, we all have things in our lives that we might not be happy with. But Jesus seems to cross all those boundaries, geographically, socially, gender. Every single boundary he crosses. Why? Because Jesus longs for this relationship. He longs, he goes out of his way, off track. He waits for her. He engages in her. He wants to have deep connection with her because she's his child, his masterpiece. She is everything to him. And that's like us. And he longs to to be a part of our lives. So how does this come into worship? This journey, this beginning, this encounter, this waiting, draws us into the heart of worship. Now, you may think about worship as something we do on a Sunday, don't we? The liturgy we talk, the the sermon, the Bible passages, the music, the sung worship here, the fellowship we have over delightful tea and coffee. That is all part of our worship. But there is so much more. Jesus is teaching us there's so much more to worship than a Sunday morning here. So let's think about what we spend most of our time doing, all those things that we love to do. And for me, it's best to think about my teenagers, what they love spending time doing, eating, sleeping, a couple of them like sport, that's all they seem to do, fuel their bodies, sport, sleep, sport, eat, sleep, 
on and on and on. Can, so, and I start to think, what do I spend my life doing? What's the main priorities? What are the things that I worship? Now, years ago, I don't know if you've ever had a neighbor like this. They make you feel really bad because they're always cleaning their car. Have you ever had one of those? And um, fixing the car, cleaning the car with the hoover, washing the car day after day. You know, might just get the Sunday cleaners, but this one was cleaning the car all the time. He knew everything about cars. Off in his lovely car, my car was filthy. It was never washed. It made me feel bad. He worshipped that car. You know, everything about his day was around the car. And there might be something that we just love to do, and that's not bad. The car's not bad. The washing is not bad of it. But it, when it becomes this obsession, this worship, and the focus of our whole day is thinking about that, then we have to really consider things, don't we? In Romans 12, it says, doesn't it, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So this is our goal, to offer our lives as worship. As we live out our life, that is our worship. So our whole mind, our heart, our soul, our strength, I'm thinking of that kid's song there, um, is in our worship. And when we do that, we're offering a holy and pleasing life to God. You see, when the woman saw the Messiah, when she saw through, it changed her whole perspective. Oh my word, this is the one that we've been talking about. This is the one I'm to worship. And she dropped everything. Do you know, in the Bible it says here, she dropped her jar. She dropped everything and surrendered her life. Her identity was for the Messiah. All the shame, all the past, was still part of her, but she could drop it and see the true Messiah here. You see, worship in that kind of culture was seen that the Jews believed the worship of God was done in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans believed the worship was done on the mountain here in Samaria. There were different places where different kinds of people worshipped. And that's where they saw it. And the woman starts to talk about these differences that, hey, you're meant to be worshipping Jerusalem. I've, I've got to worship here. What's this about? And Jesus cuts through that. And he said, it's not about place. No, that is not it. It's about the nature of worship. I don't want to know about the place you worship or how you worship. What about you as a person? Those are the kind of worshippers he's looking for. And it actually uses this word seeking. Can you imagine Jesus looking? Where are my worshippers today? Where's your heart? He's seeking. He's looking out for us. So what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? Let's look at truth, shall we? What does it mean to worship in truth? Now, the opposite of truth is false, isn't it? Truth, lies, lies and false. Now, many people know that truth is absolute. If something's true, it's got to be right. But over the years, it's just been debated. What what would be my truth could be different to somebody else's truth, depending on their culture and their background and their education. There's this sort of, you know, what I think is right and wrong could be different to somebody else. So how do we measure this truth, Jesus? How do we, how do we know that we're in that central line of truth? Is if, if my truth could be different because I'm living here in England to somebody else's truth there? And when we look at John 14, it comes clear. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. 
Jesus says, I am the truth. I'm the one, that measuring stick, that pendulum that swings. I am that center, the truth. And when you look at Jesus and his teaching, he's the truth, the one that we've got to swing back to. Now, as you know, that um, we went to New Wine over the summer, a Christian conference. So I took... Um, the family. I've been going since I've been a little one. And um, we, all, we always go. It's one of those things we always go. We don't want to miss out. And my youngest, uh, well, 16, but he changed last year, you know, come in, being a happy little boy to, oh my goodness, he's a teenager. You know, one of those moments. With my other three children, it was a gradual teenager thing. But with my youngest, it was one moment, one day, a little boy, the next day it was teenager, you know. So we sort of knew that when he got to New Wine that he didn't probably want to engage in anything, and that was the thing. On the first day, he didn't go to anything. And then the next day, and we thought we'd just leave him, the next day he went to one of the meetings, one of his youth worship meetings, and then he went again. And then we're thinking, where's Noah? And in the daytime, he went to extra things, and we were thinking, just don't say anything, just stay calm, you know. And over the week, we didn't see him at all. He was always in the worship venue. And then he used his pocket money that he'd sort of saved up by a new Bible and some notes. And we got home from New Wine thinking, this is really different. He'd been getting up earlier, doing his Bible readings. His bedroom is a little tidier for a while. Um, he was interested in doing homework, you know, all those things that weren't in his normal character. And then we heard, because I was here and my husband was in the army, so we, we didn't really... He is going to the church that we'd been to before. We'd heard that he stood up at the front of the church and he was telling everyone about how his Bible verses every day were helping him help the other boys in his school. So they were going through some really tricky problems. And he shared that actually the Bible verse really spoke into their life. So he was, it's not texting now, is it? It's, you know, chatting or whatever on his phone. And he would talk to them about it and pass on these Bible verses. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's really transformation. Now, it's not like that all the days, but, you know, I'm, I'm holding on to that promise. And, um, and it made me think about the truth in those Bible verses that he's popping into other teenagers' lives. And it's transforming their life. It's making a big difference. His priorities are changing. When it says worship in truth, it's about our priorities, isn't it? Change him. So what does it mean to worship in spirit? You see, everything about God is relationship. If we look at the Trinitarian, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all one, but all distinct. It's about relationship. And, and you know, we've talked about we're made in his image. We're made in his image to have this relationship. That's what our identity is in him. We shine a little bit of Jesus in all different aspects. So God breathed into us his spirit. We're spiritual beings. That's what we are, to live out a relationship. And here we see the relationship where Jesus engages with the woman, offering her this living water, and in this deep well, it's a, a symbol of something so deep something that come overflowing, something that's refreshing. And he's saying you can have it again and again and again. Keep drinking from his water, his living water, his refreshing spirit. And the spirit of God motivates us to live. But interestingly, worshiping in spirit and truth aren't distinct, they go together. It's no good for my youngest to know the scripture, to feed on it, to read it, and not live it out and do things that aren't in the truth that he's doing. And it's no good for me to praise God 
but live differently out of this building. They connect. They feed in. Worship is about the truth and the spirit together. So, how did this change? How did this advance the kingdom of God? And this amazing story that Jesus told was transformational. One woman in one place with one encounter changed the community. It was mission at its best here. <laughs> you know, he chose the, the one that had the most shame and isolated and transformed a community. And that's what the kingdom of God does. When we're changed in spirit and in truth, it changes us, which overflows and changes community. And that's the purpose of our worship to God. So let's take a few moments to pray. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this woman at the well. We thank you that Jesus went out of his way to meet and engage with her. He waited with her. He spoke truth into her life. And she was filled afresh with your spirit. So, Heavenly Father, we just pray for a fresh encounter of your Spirit this morning. That as we go from this place, we might be able to meet people and just by our actions for them to capture something of the love of the kingdom of God. Amen.